Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It explores how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. It looks at how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. Hey, and welcome to episode 90 of the Culture Lab podcast. So this episode is a special one, not our own production, but a feed drop. A feed drop from a podcast I'm completely addicted to, Adam Grant's Work Life, that is produced in collaboration with TED. The title of this episode, The Four Deadly Sins of Work Culture. And I promise you, you will love it. First, there is this really hilarious interview with an employee who found herself in a really, really toxic cult-like culture. And then there is a conversation about how we can do our cultural due diligence before we join a company so that we can avoid what happened to her. There is also an interview with Jenny Chatman, the co-director of the Berkeley Culture Initiative, aka The Culture Queen. And she shares why socialization beats selection when it comes to building a strong culture. And Adam Grant, he talks about the two fundamental tensions in company culture, the one between results versus relationships and rules versus risk. And he talks about the resulting four deadly sense of work culture. And finally, there is this very, very interesting theme that is super close to my heart on why stories are so crucial when it comes to uncovering and transmitting cultural DNA in any organization. So in summary, if you are a culture geek like me, you are in for an incredible, incredible treat. But before I pass it on to Adam, a quick and important note. If you want to be a part of a conversation like this one, where culture is really in focus and where we discover new, better ways of making work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, you should really check out our community, The Culture Brain. You can find it at tiny.one forward slash culture brain. And there is a link in the show notes. And now, enjoy the four cents of company culture. I found this job opening for a marketing manager and I thought, oh, that would be really fun. They were looking for someone who could do everything, like very strategic. So I applied, got the interview, and they were actually really nice. This is Maria, or at least that's what we're calling her, you know, to protect the innocent. Anyway, Maria was very excited about this new opportunity. From the outside, the job was everything she wanted. And she called me at the end of the day to offer me the job. So I quit my job like two days later. A few weeks later, she started the new job, eager to share her ideas. And as I sat down in my new desk, the designer that was sitting next to me, she's like, I tried to find you on LinkedIn to warn you not to take this job. <laughs> I'm like, why? And she told me, these people are crazy. Um, definitely not a good start. I just laughed because... It was like, okay, well, let's see how bad it actually is. Because I also wanted to give it a chance, thinking maybe she's just angry. She just doesn't like it. But in this case, I should have listened to her. The next few weeks were a wild ride. So we had a sales meeting. I was like, okay, let's try and look for a marketing way of getting customers in. And the owner was like, no, how about we just do an energy circle? And I was like, sorry, what? They all knew what that meant. So they all stood up and held hands. And I'm there just looking around like, what the hell is happening? And they just started like shaking, like, okay, shake the bad energy, shake for the universe. And then the, the owner was like, okay, universe, we need you to send us some sales. And I'm just standing there like, okay, with a folder thick full of strategies and ideas and campaign ideas, <laughs> nothing. Was this a company or a cult? It was a bit cultish because at the Christmas party, the owner wrote a song for everyone with everyone's name on it. And we had to sit there listening to him sing to us. And by early December, we get a list on my desk and it's just a list of everyone's names in an envelope. And then in, on top of the list, it says, please give whatever you'd like to contribute to show your appreciation for working here and your appreciation to 
the owner of the company. And I was just so angry and I loudly went like, what? So we have to buy him a present. <laughs> I put 50 cents. I suggested to buy everyone in the company a Christmas present out of the marketing budget. And they said, no, having a job is present enough. So the highly paid owner gets a gift, but the hardworking employees don't? Call poison control. We have to rescue some people from a toxic culture. Organizational culture has big consequences for success and happiness, but we often overlook it because it's hard to analyze. So what culture clues should you look for before you join an organization? And how do you shape the culture once you're there? I'm Adam Grant, and this is Work Life, my podcast with the TED Audio Collective. I'm an organizational psychologist. I study how to make work not suck. In this show, I take you inside the minds of fascinating people to help us rethink how we work, lead, and live. Today, culture at work, how to recognize it from the outside and strengthen it from the inside. Thanks to Morgan Stanley for sponsoring this episode. When I was in junior high school, one of the things that I used to do is type up surveys that I would give to my parents. Well, actually, not just my parents, anyone who came over, and I would ask them to fill out a paper and pencil survey. I just loved surveys. I know, super weird. I would ask all kinds of questions about how happy they were at work and what their work was like. And I, I just thought that was fascinating. Jenny Chapman is an organizational behavior professor at Berkeley. And she was clearly destined to become the queen of organizational culture. I like being a queen. I continue to be an optimist about this, that there is a place for everyone. And there are organizations and jobs that really fit with some people, but not others. And through her many years of research and countless surveys, Jenny has a clear view what organizational culture is. Culture is the values and behavioral norms that one sees expressed within an organization. And it has to be sort of a systematic pattern of norms and expectations that people have in a particular setting that they might not have in, in another setting. And one thing that's interesting about norms is there's no rule book to teach them to you. Instead, we learn them through social interaction. They're different from what's written in the, the corporate handbook. These are observed patterns of behavior and expectations that we pick up from interacting with colleagues within an organization. People often claim their cultures are unique, but when you study thousands of organizations, you can start to see underlying patterns. It all has to do with how we balance key priorities. Research reveals that there are two fundamental tensions in organizational culture. Results versus relationships, and rules versus risk. If you ignore one of those values altogether, you end up committing one of my four deadly sins of organizational culture. Toxicity, mediocrity, bureaucracy, and anarchy. The first sin of culture is toxicity, the deadliest sin of them all. New evidence on the Great Resignation shows that toxic culture is the biggest driver of turnover. More than burnout, more than low pay. Toxicity exists when a culture prioritizes results without relationships, getting things done at the cost of treating people right. The organization tolerates disrespect, abuse, exclusion, unethical decisions, and selfish cutthroat actions. If people don't get fired for those behaviors— or worse yet, still get promoted. Houston, we have a problem. At the opposite end of that spectrum is a second sin, mediocrity, valuing relationships above results. There's no accountability. People are so worried about getting along that they end up forfeiting good work. In a mediocrity, even if you do a terrible job, you can still get ahead as long as people like you. Before long, you end up with the Peter Principle, where everyone is promoted to their level of incompetence, and they get stuck there. The third sin is bureaucracy. 
That happens when a culture is all rules, no risks. New ideas are seen as threats to the status quo. People cling to process and resist creativity and change. They see questioning the way we've always done things as blasphemy. There's red tape everywhere. If you want to use the bathroom, you have to fill out paperwork. And the fourth sin is anarchy. You have risks, but no rules. Anyone can do whatever they want. Strategy and structure be damned. No one learns from the past or lands on the same page. It's pure chaos. It's bad enough when a culture commits one of these sins. But believe it or not, Maria's jewelry company managed to be guilty of all four sins. So definitely insanely toxic. People were crying there daily. Every time I went to the toilet, there was someone crying there. We used to laugh about if like, one of the cubicles was a crying cubicle. <laughs> so you would never actually go there in case someone needed it for crying. <laughs> they were a mediocrity too. And not just because they did energy circles instead of marketing. They had no system for getting results. They were a small company that grew into a bigger company and none of the top two bothered to learn how to manage a company. Incompetence the whole way through, but just act confident. They had all sorts of constraints on risk-taking. Very bureaucratic. Like you couldn't speak directly to the owner because it was very about the steps. Like remember how high I am and remember how low you are. And despite the bureaucracy around the chain of command, in other places, they didn't have enough rules. Most of Maria's job was anarchy. And turns out I kind of regressed in my career because I ended up not doing anything that I wanted to do. I'm more like a party planner and universe messenger person. I don't know. <laughs> I did not know that was a job. <laughs> well, I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> Could you have figured any of this out before you took the job? I've been thinking a lot about that. Because while I was there, I was thinking, how can I make sure that this doesn't happen again? If I had spoken to someone from the team during the interview, I am sure that the general manager would have been there with us. And other than going through LinkedIn and finding people who work there and then messaging them and saying, hey, I have just been offered this position. What do you think about the company? So I'm not sure if that's even something that I would have done. You've probably felt that hesitation too. But gathering information about a culture before you agree to join is exactly what culture queen Jenny Chapman recommends doing. I think that's a great way of helping people be kind of detectives about the culture that they're interested in, particularly people who are seeking jobs. You want to ask, you know, what what do people care about here? What are they talking about? What is behavior focusing on? How much agreement is there? Do people seem to be aligned on these issues? And finally, what are their non-negotiables? What do people get really rewarded for? Or if they violate these norms or behaviors, what do they get really punished for? You want to interview the company, but not during your job interview. Wait until you get the offer. I'm definitely doing that for my next job because if I'm getting into a new company, I want to know exactly what I'm getting into. So next time I will do more of a reverse interview. It's not about the slogans on the wall or the values on the website. Culture is revealed in the stories people tell. To gather meaningful culture stories, I have a few favorite questions for you to ask current and former employees. I posed them to some former students and their answers told me a lot about their organization's cultures. The first question is, tell me about something that happens here that wouldn't elsewhere. Every year, the class of new hires is in charge of organizing a senior team roast, where they basically spend 30 minutes live, these days over Zoom, during our end of year strategy session, roasting our senior team for things like the way they write emails, wearing pajamas during Zoom calls, mixing up people's names, basically anything embarrassing. And I think this is something truly unique about our culture for a firm in the finance industry where humor isn't often encouraged in the workplace. This is a firm that's trying to avoid both toxicity and bureaucracy. By making fun of senior people, they signal that executives want human relationships and it's okay to take risks. Also, it's pretty rare that people wearing pajamas are into red tape. 
When an investment banking report came out about uh, mistreatment of their first years, I got an email from the chairman of our organization. We'd worked together once before, but didn't know each other very well. And I was one of the only analysts he knew. He was horrified by the report and wanted to see how I felt we were doing and to make sure I didn't feel anything remotely similar. He responded to my email by saying, I hope and pray that no one at our firm would ever be treated like that. And even if one person felt they were treated badly, that that person would let us know and we could fix it immediately. If we ever fail to be people focused, please let me know whether it's about you or you're aware of anyone else at the firm. And then in all caps, nothing I care more about. It sounds like the chairman is dedicated to fighting toxicity. But culture isn't about one leader's behavior. It's about how widely shared and intensely held the values are. So I want to know how committed others in power are to curbing mistreatment and what the consequences are. In healthy cultures, no level of individual excellence justifies undermining people. You're not a high performer if you don't elevate others. Which brings us to a second question. Tell me about a time when people didn't walk the talk here. Our office has returned to in-person because in-person interactions are highly valued, according to the president of the firm. But the third most senior person at the firm is spending the entire winter in a ski town in Europe. This is a red flag. Research suggests that the worst stories about a culture are about senior leaders violating their own principles. They claim in-person relationships are valued, but apparently one of the top people is exempt from that value? Hypocrisy alert. You can also see signs of hypocrisy versus integrity by asking a third question. Tell me a story about who gets hired, promoted, and fired around here. If you're a detective, these stories are full of clues about what's really valued. An MD shared how he made MD in six years as opposed to the normal 12. He told us how he works from 4.30 a.m. until 10 p.m. and is always available. He doesn't expect it from anyone else, but he's always grinding. Considering our firm prides itself on valuing mental health, it's a bit demoralizing to hear that the way to advance quickly is to abandon those values. Here's another warning signal. The company claims to value well-being, but do they really mean it? If you want to get promoted early, good luck not working 17-hour days. Collecting stories can help you understand a culture from the outside and identify toxicity, mediocrity, bureaucracy, and anarchy before you join. But what if you're already inside? How do you build and maintain a strong culture? More on that after the break. Okay, this is going to be a different kind of ad. I play a personal role in selecting the sponsors for this podcast because they all have interesting cultures of their own. Today, we're going inside the workplace at Morgan Stanley. We like to hike. We like to climb around in the mountains. I like to be out an hour and a half from civilization fishing. My wife's super active and she just loves being out at the gym, running, doing all that kind of stuff. Meet Randy Norris. I live in the town just outside of Boise, Idaho. I'm a financial advisor with Morgan Stanley. I'm married to a wonderful partner for her life, uh, Leanne, and I have two now adult kids. One day, Leanne suffered a life-threatening medical emergency. She suddenly started coughing up blood that was filling her lungs. She was admitted to the hospital, and she stayed in the hospital for the next four or five days and did all kinds of tests trying to figure out what was going on. The only thing that really came of it that we were told was that it shouldn't happen again, but it could happen at any time. And so basically the advice was never be more than 10 or 15 minutes away from the hospital. Randy and Leanne were scared and devastated at the thought of spending the rest of their lives tethered to a hospital. But then Randy got a phone call from his insurance provider. She said, I noticed you've been going to see a number of different doctors. Are you getting the care you need? Immediately, I just said, no, no, we, we have something wrong and nobody has a good answer. And I'm really frustrated. And she said, well, Morgan Stanley offers their employees this service called Second MD. The purpose of a 
expert medical opinion service is really to provide a different point of view uh, that can help avoid surgeries, potentially help save unnecessary doctor's visits, maybe identify an alternative diagnosis or treatment that hadn't been considered, especially when there's a you know, major decision to be made. This is Dr. Dave Stark, Morgan Stanley's chief medical officer. Fundamentally, you know, the job of a chief medical officer, or frankly, the job of an HR benefits professional is to develop and manage a portfolio of products and services to help employees and their families stay healthy, happy, and productive. That's what Second MD did for Randy and his family. After being connected to specialists across the country, Leanne traveled to Oregon, where she was diagnosed with a microvascular dysfunction and underwent a successful surgery. After about three months of just not being able to figure out what was going on, Second MD came in, and within three weeks, we have a plan of action that was just guided and stepped all the way through. I've been a raving fan of Second MD ever since. Research shows that employees' commitment and loyalty depends heavily on feeling cared about and supported by their employer. Morgan Stanley has worked to meet employees where they are with services they need, in person or virtually, from child and elder to special needs care. As for Randy, he and his wife Leanne are counting their blessings. On the anniversary of her surgery, she ran her first half marathon. Life is precious, life is short. We should enjoy it and take a moment, and, but every now and then just reflect on, on the blessings we have and the miracles that happen that get us to where we're at. Morgan Stanley believes employees are their greatest asset, and they protect that asset by offering top quality healthcare options and comprehensive programs to support physical and emotional well-being. Learn more at morganstanley.com slash rbenefits. The first person who shapes the culture of an organization is the founder. Our founder, Barkley Simpson, um, had his nine principles of doing business. And it's something that we refer to all the time. And one of them is everybody matters. Meet Annie Cow. She's the VP of engineering at Simpson Manufacturing. They make anchors and fasteners for building foundations and decks. We are a manufacturer and engineering company of building connections that help people build and design safer, stronger structures. And Simpson's been doing that for a long time. Just celebrated our 65th birthday. I thought it was really intriguing that you said, we celebrated our 65th birthday. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of people, when they talk about their company, they wouldn't know what their company's birthday was. <laughs> What's behind that? God, you know, I didn't even pick up on that. But I think for me, like the, the people are Simpson. I feel like I am a very active owner of who Simpson is and what Simpson is. And so, you know, the successes that we have as a company, both on the financial side, on the products that we're able to release, like I have very personal pride associated with that because I just, I know the people and the work that it took to deliver it. That identification with the company, that pride of ownership is a sign that Simpson has an unusually strong culture. It's very personal because I think that what the company does is a clear reflection on, you know, who I am as, you know, as, as a person, as an engineer, as a parent. Strong culture is one of Jenny Chapman's specialties as a researcher. You can tell how strong a culture is by paying close attention to what she calls crystallization and intensity. There's a question about how much people agree about the culture. That's the crystallization piece. Does everyone in the organization agree that innovation is important? Or is there fragmentation where our engineers want to be on the cutting edge of things, but our marketing folks want to pull back and, and just provide what customers are asking for? And there's the question of intensity, which is what are the things that we're that are absolute non-negotiables for us in the organization. Simpson doesn't just have a strong culture. Jenny has observed it up close as an unusually healthy one. So full disclosure, I'm on the board of Simpson Manufacturing. Even before consultants were billing hours for cultural transformation, Bark was building a strong culture. 
And he had a number of principles. One was that he really supported his people within the organization and expected to do most of their promotions from within the company. So there was a real investment in developing people. An investment that often took people by surprise, including Annie. Barkley Simpson, our founder, used to attend all of the orientation classes that we held at our corporate office. So everyone who starts at Simpson attends this week-long orientation at our home office, and Bark would attend all of those. And he would have 30 minutes. He'd go around, ask everyone's name, ask about their families, and talk a little bit about the history. And he would just kind of sit down in one of the you know, conference chairs along with us. And then I think of other leaders that have guided our company, and just the common factor is how kind of openly caring they were, how much they made time for employees. It's, it's something that I have really tried to do just within my department with engineering is like, I need to be that, you know, for the employees. And so just making sure that, you know, I'm owning that and also expecting that of my team because that's the kind of culture that we want and we have to keep it alive and just not assume that someone else is doing it. It's often said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. But the reality is that a strong culture can serve your strategy. Yeah, I do think there is something to the motto in that if your culture is not aligned with your strategy, good luck. It's probably not going to be executed very well, or if at all. But I also think that strategy is what gives organization its purpose. Without a strategic objective, the question is sort of why organize or why be an organization? You're you're coming together for a purpose. You're trying to accomplish something together. The culture should be the kind of engine that allows you to execute on that strategy more or less effectively. So if you want to build a strong culture, you need to identify the core values that you're trying to crystallize. But crystallization alone is not enough. You've probably come across a workplace where everyone agrees on the values, but no one really upholds them. Think of your U.S. Postal Service, where, you know, who knew that their motto was customers first, right? Like, who knew? (laughs) Right? They got the coffee mugs, they have the banners, but is anyone willing to sort of stay past 5 p.m. to ensure that everybody on the line is is served? Probably not. And and in fact, it's, it's the most common case in organizations to have high crystallization and low intensity because typically leaders are asking people to agree with pretty good stuff like quality or customers. Sure, I like customers, you know. The real question though is, Are people punished for a failure to uphold the norms? And are they willing to sanction one another? That's where intensity comes in. There was this case at Nordstrom that is known as a strong culture organization. An experience I had where a shoe salesperson was helpful, but not overly helpful. And another salesperson came over, which I happened to to overhear because, you know, eavesdropping is tax deductible for me, right? I happen to overhear (laughs) this, this conversation between the two. And the second salesperson was actually admonishing the first one for not going above and beyond in in helping me. So that's the sign of real intensity. Are people willing to take an interpersonal risk in order to uphold those norms? That might sound a little, well, intense. But it's the point of a strong culture. People enforce it even when the boss isn't watching. At Simpson, the crystallization and intensity around the principles is a big reason why people regularly stay for the long haul, sometimes decades. I just celebrated my 15-year anniversary with Simpson. Is that a thing? An anniversary with a company? Yes. And so we have this really cool online network where we can actually go and celebrate our coworkers anniversaries. And so you can post messages and like kind of memories. I was just happened to be the lucky recipient of like, I think 50 messages from people that I've worked with congratulating me, which was pretty emotional and overwhelming. The anniversaries are a result of that strong culture. And the messages also help to maintain that culture. They reinforce the principle that everybody matters. And I think part of it too, is everyone like wants to be a part of this 
like winning team, if you will, that the work that you do matters and, and people who enjoy their work and, and bring that passion with them to their work just give so much more of themselves. So I, I feel like it's translated itself financially for us. We passed the $1 billion mark. I saw that there were some analysts who were predicting that we would be, you know, maybe $2 billion by the end of this year. And it's like, oh, okay. Like, we really see that the hard work and the culture that we build actually translates into financial success, which is a kind of self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. What, what you just described dovetails very nicely with what we see in the research on, on strong cultures, which is, you know, one talented people are more attracted to them because there's a clear signal. This, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. Yeah. And that differentiates you in the marketplace. Two, heightened motivation over and over again. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not just doing a job, I'm advancing a mission. Mm-hmm. And three, those two things obviously feed into retention nicely. And they do that in part through a sense of belonging, right? Like, when the, when the culture is strong, like, well, everybody shares the same values and also is passionate about the same values as me. And I can't imagine working anywhere else because how am I going to find that again? Yes, yes. So how do you create that kind of commitment and build a strong organizational culture? In her research, Jenny compared the effects of selection versus socialization. How much of culture is who you let on the bus versus how you drive it? It turns out that people are, within some parameters, pretty pretty flexible in terms of how much they can um, grow to adapt and fit with or even appreciate the culture that they're a part of. Wow. I think you just said that socialization eats selection for breakfast. That's right. That's right, which which is interesting because I think if you asked most leaders, they would say it's about, about who you hire. And it turns out that people are actually more adaptable than we give them credit for. Jenny finds that when it comes to building a strong culture, socialization beats selection. The values and norms you set are more than twice as influential as who you hire. So if you want to strengthen your culture, the first step is to bring it to life for people, especially new hires. Culture isn't just communicated through the stories we tell. It's created through the stories we tell. You want to find and share stories about a time when the culture became real. Stories are vital. I like to advise leaders to see themselves as curators of key stories within organizations. You need to tell the story, but also give the moral of the story. And so one very well-known example is Southwest Airlines. They were running out of money early in their operations. They were using four jets at the time. And they couldn't make their payroll, so they had to sell one of the jets to pay employees that month. And they went to employees and said, we're going to sell one of our jets, but we want to run the same routes with three jets instead of four. How can we do that? And employees came back with the idea of turning the planes more quickly than they were before. So Southwest now continues to be known for its turn time, the amount of time it takes to come back in the gate, unload passengers and bags, you know, clean the plane, reload passengers and bags, and take off. And that's part of Southwest's sort of deep strategy. So that story got told not just for the substance that turn time is important, but for the relationship between leaders and employees and who actually came up with the idea. And everyone at Southwest knows that story, and it absolutely maps on to the culture that emphasizes both urgency and speed, but also a deep investment and mutual respect between employees and leaders in the organization. Research reveals that the most powerful stories are about people living your values. Once you've identified your best culture stories, The second step is to reward and promote the protagonists in them. Celebrate people who exemplify your values. You would definitely want to focus on the formal and informal reward systems. Formally, if you have control over compensation and you can 
reward that financially, that gets people's attention very quickly. But then there are a whole host of informal rewards, you know, whether that's gift certificates for lunch or a cake celebration for someone who had a small win that's consistent with the desired new culture. These are ways of really capturing people's attention. Wait a minute. If I heard you correctly, you're saying I shouldn't just pay people for their performance. I should pay them for their contributions to the culture? Well, yeah, because... If in my way of thinking about culture, the culture is your path to strategy execution, then culture is almost a proxy for top performance. Wow. This is, it's such a big step for so many organizations that are used to, like, I I would say most of the organizations I've worked with over time are, are, they've gotten good at measuring individual results and they know how to figure out if you are a superstar. They have no idea what your impact on the culture is. That's right. And then the final lever, of course, is the leader's own behavior, right? She needs to absolutely emulate the culture that she's trying to cultivate. And there's no substitute for that because people are looking at leaders for an understanding of what's important. This is the third step. Leaders have to show up and model the values every day. That's a principle Annie learned from Bark Simpson, the company's founder, and the CEOs who followed him. I just do office hours. We've been trying to build that in and just say, like, our schedules are so busy. Everyone never has time. So I'm going to actually make that time. I'm going to be available for two hours on Monday morning, right after we've done our earnings call. So if you have questions about why we decided to do this, why we didn't move that project forward, What the heck was Karen talking about with the financials? I have made the time for that. So, Annie, I haven't asked you yet about the dark side of strong cultures, but (laughs) I want to because we we see empirically that uh, despite all the upsides, the challenges that strong cultures run into have to do with groupthink and homogeneity and Mm -hmm. becoming sort of stuck in the way we've always done things as opposed to adapting and evolving. Yeah. Have you seen that? How have you navigated it? (sighs) Yeah, we... It's so funny you're asking me this question because we were just talking about this as an engineering team is how do we make sure we have, you know, a diverse set of perspectives and opinions so that we don't fall into groupthink and that like, well, this is how we've always done it. Let's just not assume that we're not doing, you know, groupthink. Like, how are we making sure to put together diverse teams, right? Like, what questions are we asking as we start a project or as we put people on projects to make sure that it has the right right mix of people? And and I think we ask ourselves that questions too when we hire, like, who can, who is the right new person on the team to challenge what we're doing? And how do we celebrate being challenged what we're doing so that we are kind of, we're looking for it (laughs) and that it's not something that, you know, catches us by surprise. This is the paradox of strong cultures. If you want them to stay strong, flexibility needs to be one of your core values. Cultures are like buildings. Without proper maintenance, they fall apart. A culture needs regular service and sometimes a full-scale renovation. So how do you know what kind of maintenance your culture needs? You do a culture audit. A culture audit is actually pretty straightforward. You can start by saying, here are our current norms. And then you could say, if we were fully executing on our strategy, what would our norms be? And then you can identify the gaps and figure out a bunch of behaviors that can fix that using these levers. Who would we hire? How would we socialize, orient, and train people? What stories would we tell? Who would we promote? How would we reward people? You know, what would leaders be doing? At that point, you could get to real behavioral change that could be of value. 
Yeah. And one of the things I love about the idea of a culture audit is I can go and get responsibility for that, even if I'm not in charge, right? And in some ways, I'm I'm taking a task that nobody has time for or might not already be in anybody's job description. And I'm saying, hey, leaders, you can't be everywhere. You can't see everything. Can I help you figure out what's working in the culture and what needs to be improved? And if I can, if I can get that project, then I have a chance to then shape the the discovery of data that could convince leaders that we need to make some adjustments. And then the next piece of that would be that you make the culture changes part of the work that people are doing anyway. At Simpson, they have their version of a culture audit. It's a culture and leadership survey. And so the first time we did this, there was feedback that people felt that they couldn't really say something if they saw something that was against our values or against our policies. And so as a result, we launched a program uh, specifically to address that called Speak Up, Listen Up. We opened an anonymous phone tip line. We had an anonymous form you could fill online. All managers took training. We kind of put our money where our mouth is. Wow. This, This sounds like an example of protecting the culture. Yeah, I would say everyone in our company is responsible for protecting the culture. And what it means for me is just is, is going back and making sure that we are a, a values-driven organization. And so I'm going to do whatever I can as a leader in our organization to make sure that that is pervasive through every single role, every single level, because that's not something that we are willing to you know, go halfway on. And if we do, then that's not a company that I want to work for. The ultimate test of a strong culture is, can it adapt? Building a great workplace isn't just about expecting people to adapt to the culture. It's also about adapting the culture to the people and the world. As the world evolves, your culture needs to evolve with it. Next time, wrapping up season five of Work Life. People have this sort of skepticism about change and everything you hear about change is pessimistic. I mean, everything in our lives is change. For some reason, we code the really difficult things as change and everything else is just like a choice. Organizational change from the bottom up and the top down. Work Life is hosted by me, Adam Grant. The show is produced by TED with Transmitter Media. Our team includes Colin Helms, Greta Cohn, Dan O'Donnell, Joanne DeLuna, Grace Rubenstein, Michelle Quint, Ben Ben Chang, and Anna Phelan. This episode was produced by Constanza Gallardo. Our show is mixed by Ben Chano. Our fact checker is Paul Durbin. Original music by Hansel Sue and Allison Layton Brown. Ad stories produced by Pineapple Street Studios. Special thanks to our sponsors. LinkedIn, Morgan Stanley, ServiceNow, and UKG. For their studies of organizational culture, gratitude to the following researchers and their colleagues. Charles O'Reilly, Chad Hartnell, Shalom Schwartz, Joanne Martin, Sean Martin, Alan Benson, Donald Saul, Konstantinos Kutiferis, and my beloved late colleague, Sigal Barsay. The people that were there when I was there are still there. And this was like two years ago. I sat there with them trying to figure out how we could start their own businesses. Because <laughs> I said, you need to get out of here. For toxic cultures, there should be some kind of extraction team that you can send in. <laughs> <There should be. laughs> like a SWAT team that's going to go in and rescue everyone. Ugh. That's a good business idea. Maybe a recruiter company could specialize in saving teams that are stuck in a shitty culture. I think that is a business waiting to be launched. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. Adam Grant and I, we hope that it will inspire you to think broader and deeper about the driving forces behind culture. And if you'd like an opportunity to interact with guests of the Culture Lab podcast in live sessions, where you can learn more on the topics that we discuss on the show, this is just one of many benefits you'd enjoy if you are a member of the Culture Brain community. So Culture Brain is this one-of-a-kind global community for culture leaders 
who actually look for new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures, especially now in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. It's a really diverse group of culture leaders from Fortune 100 to tiny startups. And what they have in common is the fact that they're all guided by our values of being bold, being kind, and being curious. And you know what? We'd love for you to join us if it feels like the right fit for you. You can learn more about Culture Brained at tiny.one forward slash culture brained, and you'll find the link in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in and listening to this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share this episode with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, you can do it on any podcast streaming platform of your choice. If you want to receive our weekly insights on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash agabayer. That's T-I-N-Y-U-R-L.com forward slash A-G-A-B-A-J-E-R. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it. And finally, the entire Culture Lab team and our guests, we are going to continue exploring how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging, and how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So... What do you want to hear about next? What matters to you? Email us at lindsay at agabayer.com and let us know.